High on the windswept northern face of Stone Mountain is a giant sculpture. It is a stunning combination of art, technology, and engineering. Created as a memorial to three of the South's Civil War heroes, this distinctive work has also become a monument to the men who actually carved it. The first sculptor to work on the project was Gutzon Borglum, a man famous for both his art and his flamboyance. He was selected by the United Daughters of the Confederacy to create a memorial to General Robert E. Lee. But instead of the single figure his sponsors had imagined, Borglum envisioned Lee with an entire army of figures marching across the mountain's face. Funding delays in World War I stalled the work until 1923. In the meantime, Borglum considered the staggering question of how to actually do the work, 400 feet above the ground on the sheer face of a mountain, creating figures as large as buildings. The first challenge was to transfer the design onto the mountain's face in proper scale. Borglum's solution was to create a line drawing of the design, project the drawing onto the mountain, and have his crew outline the drawing with paint Critics said this technique created distortions in perspective and would never work. But Borglum was undaunted. With a design painted on the face of the mountain, he and his crew began to carve. They used small charges of dynamite to rough out the head of Lee. Then, with pneumatic drills and hand chisels, they took more than a year to hew the details into the stone. With typical flair, including a breakfast for dignitaries on the shoulder of General Lee, Borglum dramatically unveiled his first piece. The first head on Stone Mountain was Borglum's last. He and his sponsors fell into a bitter dispute. Borglum left the project and moved on to what became his most famous work, the carvings on South Dakota's Mount Rushmore. Though none of Borglum's work remains on the mountain, his legacy lingers. The scale of the project, as it was eventually completed, is a tribute to Borglum's ability to dream. The next sculptor on the project was Augustus Lutman, a man whose artistry and work style contrasted sharply with Borglum's. Lutman designed a new head of General Lee, and several months into the project had Borglum's work blasted off the mountain. Lukman was very methodical in his work and realistic in his goals. He created a new design for the memorial which focused on a central tableau of primary figures. Unlike Borglum, Lukman spent very little time up on the mountain. He depended heavily on his carving crew for the day-to-day -day decisions. Many of the crewmen, like dynamite specialist Charles J. Tucker, had worked under Borglum. Nearly all of the men came not from artistic backgrounds, but from the stone quarry trade. They were experts with the quarrymen's tools. The superintendent of Lukeman's crew was George Weiblin. Weiblin's family had long operated a quarry at Stone Mountain. He was very familiar with the mountain and with the demanding work of cutting granite. In addition to two blacksmiths, kept busy at the foot of the mountain, repairing and sharpening tools, the crew averaged 12 men, eight of whom were stone carvers. They used dynamite and hand tools to rough out the figures. Then Lukeman's chief carver, Teodora Bottinelli, went to work. Bottinelli patiently drew the face of Robert E. Lee out of the mountain and began the head of Jefferson Davis. But before the work could go much further, the project organizers lost their lease on the mountain. The carving again came to a halt. Lukman always hoped to return to the project. No one imagined that three decades, a Great Depression, and a Second World War would pass before the work began again. Still, Augustus Lukman and his crew left their mark on the mountain. Work began again in 1964 this time under the auspices of the state of Georgia 
and the direction of sculptor Walker Hancock, the carvers picked up where Lukman had left off. Not only did they use Lukman's models, they also used his system for accurately transferring the design. Using a technique called pointing, measuring from point to point on the model and calculating those same reference points on the face of the mountain, the crew was able to transfer the design onto the mountain in a scale 12 times larger than the model. Hancock never claimed to be the sculptor on the project. He felt that his job was to complete Lukeman's vision. But he did change Lukeman's design slightly, and some called it a stroke of brilliance. He decided to carve only Lukeman's three central mounted figures and to allow the legs of the horses to disappear into the stone at the bottom of the tableau. The technique gave the whole work a greater sense of majesty and focused attention on the heads and faces of the heroes. Hancock's carving crew, like his design, also had continuity with Lukeman. Once again, the superintendent of carving was George Weiblin. Again, Weiblin turned to the quarry industry to select most of his workers. They had to be men who could stand to work on open scaffolding 33 stories high in winds that never stopped gusting. They had to be men who, as Weiblin put it, weren't scary. He brought back Charles Tucker. Howard Williams and Roy Faulkner came on board to assist. Joseph Canales became the chief carver. This time, the crew had a powerful new tool imported from the quarry industry, the thermo jet torch. Burning a mixture of kerosene and oxygen, the torch could produce an intense flame of 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. One man with the torch could do the work of a dozen men or more using conventional tools. A large torch was used for roughing out the shapes. A smaller one was used for detail work. Shortly after work began, Hancock and Weiblin realized that Joseph Canales was not up to the challenge of carving at this scale. Yet, there were few stonecutters left in the region who really knew how to work granite. They found a master stonecutter named Cohen Ludwig in North Carolina and asked him to take the job. Ludwig knew he had an almost paralyzing fear of heights, yet, like the other members of the crew, he also knew that this was the job of a lifetime, a chance to make history. Ludwig was a master at using shadows and relief and the natural colors of the granite to create illusions of depth and dimension. He was able to do it in huge scale on the relatively flat face of Stone Mountain. He concentrated on the most critical details, completing the head of Davis and carving the head of Jackson. Having finished these, Ludwig simply wanted to come down from the mountain and go home. Hancock and Weiblin felt a sense of urgency to complete the carving and were not sure where next to turn. Fortunately, the chief rigger, Roy Faulkner, had been watching closely and had developed great skills at using the thermojet torch. And so, among the many ironies of the memorial, is that the great sculpture was actually finished by a man who never had an art lesson in his life. Part of finishing the sculpture was making certain it looked right on the mountain. Lukeman and his crew had made errors in the execution of several details. Hancock suggested several artistic changes as the carving emerged. Some of the corrections and changes required Faulkner and the crew to attach large patches of stone to the face of the carving and to reshape parts of the figures. Finally, the sculpture was completed. That this monument exists at all is a testament to the relationship that Walker Hancock built with his crew, their ability to communicate and respond to changing conditions on the mountain, and to the skill and determination of the quarrymen 
turned monument makers. The dedication of the memorial was a national event with Vice President Spiro Agnew summing up the meaning of the carving in terms of our national history. The men we honor here today, Lee, Davis, and Jackson, were bonded together in war and are now bonded together for the ages on a great mountain of granite. But the true heart and soul of it is more surely expressed in the words of one of the men who helped carve the mountain, Roy Faulkner. You feel like you're a part of history. The deep feeling that you have about uh, something like this is it's just hard to explain. It's so uh, personal from within. I don't suppose I could say I like the carving. Uh, I have literally fell in love with it. Art, technology, and engineering. This distinctive work has become a monument to the men who actually carved it. <laughs>